Hey, Chapel Street Church family. You know, today we begin a brand new sermon series called The Rhythm of Rest, where we're going to explore the meaning of Sabbath uh, in the life uh, of those who follow Jesus. What does God mean when he calls us and says, come unto me and I will give you rest? And to be honest, we could use that. Many of us are weary of the restlessness and the unrest we've been experiencing in our nation over these past months. Weary of the unrest of the pandemic, weary of the racial unrest, weary of the political unrest. And this past Wednesday, January 6th, the day the Christian church historically celebrates Epiphany, the moment when the, Jesus was revealed to the Gentiles, when the Magi came and bowed before the infant king. On that day, a mob stormed our nation's capital, the Capitol building to be precise. A woman lost her life, and it was a tragic scene, um, and one will never forget. Now, since that day, I've seen so much rumor and innuendo and all kinds of opinion swirling around on social media and on the internet. I have nothing to add to that. I don't want to add to that. And I would caution all of us against that. What I do want to do is call us as a church family, as a community of faith, to pray. We're commanded to pray in all times and on all occasions. We're told to pray for our country and our nation's leaders. And so Chapel Street Church Let's be a praying church in this moment of all moments. Let's keep praying. Don't be distracted by those who co-opt movements and slogans for their own agendas. Don't take the bait from various headlines and narratives. Watch your own reactivity. Instead, pray. It seems like foolishness to the world, but it's how the church wages war in this moment and in all moments. It's how the church brings about change. We pray, we seek our king. It's how we receive our marching orders and it aligns our hearts to the priorities of our crucified and risen king. So before you speak or post or act, pray. As you speak or post or act, pray. After you speak or post or act, pray. Let's commit to being a praying church. Let's not allow uh, the discourse and the division that's happening to infiltrate our hearts and our lives. Let's be committed to pray. When you don't have the words, pray. When you don't know what to do, pray. If this season has taught us anything, it's taught us this, that the problems we face as a nation, as individuals, cannot be solved by government alone, by elected officials alone, by any human institution. There's only one who can solve them, and so let's seek him in prayer. And so I want to invite you right now in this moment just to pray with me. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Will you pray with me? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm grateful for Pastor Jeff's words and perspective, by the way, sent to us from his vacation in Florida. And I'm grateful mostly for his reminder to pray and his reminder of just how beautiful the Lord's Prayer is. So thank you, Pastor Jeff. Well, as many of you know, I grew up as a PK, that is, a preacher's kid. And that meant for our family, life revolved around the church. And Sunday was always the most important day of the week. I mean, when I was growing up, we had Sunday school at 9.45 in the morning, straight into what we called big church or worship at 11. And then we went back to church, sometimes for youth group at 6, and then evening service at 7 in the evening. In between all of that, we did two things. We had our family Sunday dinner, and then there was nap time. My parents had taught us that Sunday was a day of rest and nap time was mandatory as I was growing up. I now know all these years later that nap time for my parents was about a little bit more than napping, which is why they always locked their bedroom door. I think you can probably connect those dots. By the way, the ancient Jewish Sabbath traditions included an expectation, a mandate for marital napping, and that's true. And I would guess some of you just got way more interested in Sabbath rest. Now, nap time was fine when we were little boys, but somewhere around 11 or 12 years old, I started to push back on the whole nap time thing. 
I mean, I didn't want to spend Sunday afternoon napping. I wanted to watch a ball game on TV. I wanted to go out and play ball with my friends. I mean, I'd already been to Sunday school and church. We were going back to church in the evening, and I figured that had to be enough to keep God happy. I wanted Sunday afternoons for myself. So I developed a strategy, a theological strategy. So the next time I I asked my parents if I could go out and play with my friends, and they said Sunday's the day of rest, I had my argument ready. I said, Mom and Dad, Sunday is a day of rest, right? And that means God wants us to rest from work, right? I think you'd agree that playing is not working, right? So therefore, I think play is a form of rest. And that means God would want me to play on Sundays. Now, whether they were convinced by my theological brilliance or just realized I was getting too old for naps, my parents relaxed the Sunday nap requirement and I was allowed to play. So here's the question, who was right? My parents or me? Well, both and neither. Today we begin a four-week series called Rhythm of Rest. And like Jeff said, we are going to explore the ancient and biblical practice of Sabbath. Now I know that when we hear the word Sabbath, uh, we hear a word that's just a bit foreign to us. We hear a Jewish tradition. As most of us didn't grow up in the Jewish culture, we might think, well, you know, that's not really for us. And I'm going to suggest today that this kind of thinking would be wrong. We might think of Sabbath as going to church on Sunday or taking a day off from work. And we'd be maybe a little closer, but we'd still be mostly wrong. By the end of this series, we hope that you'll understand Sabbath as both a noun and a verb. Uh, That it's not just a day of the week. It is a day, but it's much more than a day. It's something that we do. It's something that we pursue. It's something that we plan for. It's something that we can experience And we hope you'll understand in a much deeper and personal way what God means by Sabbath rest. I think this is a great time for this particular study because I suspect many of us are tired. We're tired of COVID. We're tired of wearing our masks all the time. We're tired of Zoom calls. As Jeff said, we're weary, weary of the seemingly relentless bad news in our country. Maybe we're just worn out from the holidays. I wonder how many of you would admit today, if I ask you directly, are you tired? Yeah, I thought so. Now, when you hear we're going to talk about Sabbath, many of you may assume that we're going to start with the Sabbath commandment, the fourth of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And while we are going to get there eventually, that's not where we're going to start. We're going to start at the beginning, way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Here's what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, we're going to look at the same set of verses three more times because there are three things I want us to see today. God worked, God rested, and God blessed. Let's begin with God worked. Now, I've talked about this over the years, but I'm a list guy. Uh, This is my to-do list for this week. Uh, How many of you are list makers? I mean, it's the only way to go, right? Make a list. I make my list every Sunday night or Monday morning of all the things I need to do that week for my work, for my personal stuff, for family stuff, for errands. And when I get an item done, if you're a list maker, you know what I do, I joyfully cross it off the list, right? I, for example, here, write sermon. I can cross that one off. And if I do something that's not on my list, what do I do? I have to go back and write it down and cross it off even after I've done it. For example, I could write down here, record sermon, which I'm doing right now. But I'll cross that off because I'm doing that right now. And it gives me this great sense of accomplishment. And actually, the first chapter of Genesis reads a little bit like God's to-do list. Let's see. Day one, create the heavens and the earth, make light and darkness. Check. Day two, separate the water on the earth from the water above the earth. Check. 
Skipping down to day six, create one human being from the dust of the earth and then create the other one from a rib from the first one and make them male and female in my image. Check. And then we read this. Notice the words I put in red. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The words in red have to do with God's work. Now, work is a Hebrew word, um, melaka, which means occupation, work, craftsmanship, or business. And throughout the Old Testament, it's used to describe all kinds of human labor. Working in a field, working with leather, tending cattle, building walls, all use the same word. And we're told here three times in three verses that God worked. God's work was creation, and God finished his work. Now, if we go back to Genesis 1 and read that, we'll see that five times in that one first chapter of the Bible, God looks at what he has done, what he has made, and says it is good. Work is is good. God's work is good. Therefore, our work is also good. As human beings, we are created in the image of God, which means, among many other things, we are created to work. Adam, the first man, was given a work to do. Genesis 2.15 tells us the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Adam's work was to joyfully participate in God's loving and bountiful provision. And work only became a struggle, only became painful, only became a burden after the fall into sin. Now, did you know that all work is ordained by God? That your work matters to him because it honors his image in you. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Work is good. You might be a salesperson, an engineer, a computer programmer, a bus driver, a teacher, a stockbroker, a business owner, a stay-at-home mom or dad, but your work matters. Your work honors God. Your work is good because it blesses others But somewhere along the way, somewhere between Genesis 2 and today where we live, something has happened to work. A few years ago, I played golf uh, with a man who at that time was uh, coming to our church who happened to be the CEO of a very large company. And as we drove around the course in a golf cart, uh, hitting some very bad golf shots, I noticed that he had put his cell phone uh, sort of propped up in the cart where he could see it. Uh, It would buzz literally every few minutes, and sometimes he would pick it up and answer, sometimes he would just look at it and put it back down. Now, this was on a Saturday morning, a beautiful fall Saturday morning, and we were on a golf course, and he was still working. So eventually, I said something like, kind of hard to get away, isn't it? And then he said, yeah, we have offices all over the world, so someone is always working. And then he told me a story about there was a time when there was a whole season of his life when he had to sleep in the closet of his bedroom so he could answer his phone in the middle of the night without waking up his wife. And it struck me, this was a CEO of a billion-dollar company living in a million-dollar house, and he was sleeping on the floor of his closet because he could not get away from his work. The Japanese have a word, karoshi, that means literally death by overwork. Did you know that Americans now work 137 more hours on average every year than the Japanese? 260 more hours than the British and almost 500 more hours than the French every year. We work more than any industrialized country in the world and we're proud of it. We call it a work ethic. We see a a friend at church on Sunday, we say, hey, how's it going? Our friend says, good, good, but busy, work's just crazy lately. And that's a good thing to us. No one ever says, good, I'm just so rested and content with my life right now. Can't remember the last time I felt stressed. I'm kind of looking around for things to do. No, we never say that because it would violate our cultural idols of work, 
accomplishment, accumulation, and busyness. We've turned work and all that work gives us into our metric for success and happiness. And we're going to talk a a lot more about this next week. But for now, we've simply made work into an idol. And the result is, as one writer says, that we have become perhaps the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. The Bible tells us that work is good, but work is not God. God worked, his work was good, but God finished his work, and then God did something else. And that leads us to the second point today, and that is God rested. God rested. Well, we finally got some snow uh, this past week. Uh, Not exactly a white Christmas, more like a white first couple of weeks of January. Uh, But snow means that I get to shovel my driveway. Now, this is an old photo of me along with two of our four boys. But over the years, one of our favorite things to do together has been to shovel the driveway. No matter how deep the snow, no matter how late at night it comes, we get out there and we shovel the driveway and our sidewalks. People ask me, do you have a snowblower? I said, nope, I have four sons. But the best part of what we do there, and we have a blast while we're shoveling, but the best part is when we finish. We usually high five or we fist bump and we put the shovels down and we just enjoy our shared work. We celebrate. We stand there in the driveway, clean, cleaned off of snow, and we gaze upon the work of our hands, and it is good. Now that's a hint of what we see in Genesis chapter 2. Let me read it again and watch for the words I put in blue. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work and all he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. For six days, the Bible says God worked. He created, he accomplished, he finished, he crossed it off his list. By the way, how's that for a productive week, huh? What did you do this week? Well, I prepared a sermon. I outlined a few team sessions. I had a few Zoom meetings. God's like, I created the universe. I made every living thing. I made human beings in my image. Then he rested. I don't think I've ever put that on my to-do list. Have you? To rest? To Sabbath? Question, why did God rest? Was God tired? Was he worn out from making everything that is? Remember what Isaiah the prophet says. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. The God of the Bible is omnipotent. That is all-powerful. He never gets tired. He never gets weary, but he rested. The Hebrew word translated rest is Shabbat or Sabbath. Now, We think of Sabbath as a noun, and it is. But here in Genesis 2, it's a verb. It means to cease, to stop, to desist from labor. So after accomplishing all his work of creation, God Sabbathed. The question is, why did God rest if he wasn't tired? I think the Bible is telling us that God intentionally ceased his work in favor of something even better. God was building the rhythm of rest into the very fabric of creation. Think about it. We have day and we have night. The human body is hardwired for this rhythm of waking and sleeping. And when this rhythm is disturbed, we have real problems. We get sick. Did you know that 70 million Americans today suffer from some sort of sleep disorder? Or think of the seasons, spring and summer, seasons of planting and growth, fall and winter, seasons of harvest and rest. Even in a football game, what happens between plays? The players all go back and they huddle up and they rest for 30 or 40 seconds. At halftime, they rest again before going out and trying to beat each other silly. Go Bears! 
But this rhythm of rest, the rhythm of Sabbath, is built into the very laws of the universe. Arguing, I saw someone who wrote this, arguing about whether we have to keep the Sabbath is like arguing about whether we have to keep the law of gravity. It doesn't make any sense. Gravity just is. And we ignore it at our own peril. And the same is true with Sabbath. In his book entitled Sabbath, author Wayne Muller writes this. Poisoned by this hypnotic belief that good things come only through unceasing determination and tireless effort, we can never truly rest. And for want of rest, our lives are in danger. God rested. God Sabbathed. God built a rhythm of rest, of Sabbath, into the very fabric of the universe, and he built it into each one of us. So God worked, God rested, and thirdly, God blessed. God blessed. Let's go back to our text again one last time. Notice the words in red. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Notice the two things that God did to the seventh day. First, he blessed the seventh day. What does it mean that he blessed the seventh day? If we go back to day five, in creation, when God created the sea creatures and the flying birds, we read in Genesis 1.22, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And in Genesis 2.22, after he created human beings in his own image, he said, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase. Uh, oops, that's the same verse. We got the wrong one on there. But it says, be fruitful and fill and subdue the earth. Now, to say God blessed means that he blessed both the creatures of the air and the sea, and he blessed human beings to be fruitful and increase to bring life. And now he blesses a day. That is, the Sabbath is blessed to bring life. Work does not do that. God created rest. God created Sabbath to be life-giving. Secondly, you'll notice that he made the seventh day holy. Now, this is the first time the word holy appears in the Bible. And holy just means to sanctify, to set apart, to make something different and special. We call the Bible the Holy Bible because it's unlike any other book. And this is the only thing God made in all of creation that he calls holy. And it's the seventh day. In other words, God sanctified time. Now we tend to think of places as holy. Temples, shrines, cathedrals. But that's not what God does. God makes a day holy. Why? I think it's because the God of the Bible... Yahweh, cannot be located in a building. It's because the God of the Bible, Yahweh, I am that I am, cannot be limited to a place. Rather, the God of the Bible is found and experienced in the world of time. He is found in Sabbath. Here's something that's not only interesting, but very critical to our understanding. As many of you know, um, most ancient cultures and religions in the history of the world, have their own creation stories. And there are dozens and dozens of these creation myths. The Sumerians and the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, they all have them. And there are, but there are three things that are absolutely unique to the biblical account of creation. First is this. In other creation stories, in almost every other creation story, the physical world of matter is most often described as bad or corrupt. And the spiritual world is described as good. But that's not so in the Bible. In the Bible, the created world is good. Everything God made is good. Secondly, in most other ancient mythologies, men are created uh, by the gods, and then the women, females, are seen as a kind of 
as a kind of mistake or as a kind of lesser being. But not so in the Bible. In the biblical account, women are made in the image of God just as men are made in the image of God. And that's unique. But thirdly, and for our point today, the God of the Bible offers his creatures, his creation, the gift of rest. The idea of Sabbath is found nowhere else in ancient religious history. And that tells us that we worship a God who cares for us by giving us the gift of rest, Sabbath. So here's where we begin, our whole understanding of Sabbath. Sabbath is not just a day off. It's much, much more. To Sabbath means not to set aside time to catch up on errands or laundry or the thousand little things you still have on your to-do list. Sabbath is not just Sunday church. That certainly may be part of a Sabbath, but it's much more than that. Listen to how Wayne Muller describes Sabbath in his book. He writes, Sabbath reminds us that we are always and already on sacred ground. The gifts of grace and delight are present and abundant. The time to live and love and give thanks and rest and delight is now, this moment, this day. Feel what heaven is like. Have a taste of eternity. Rest in the arms of the divine. We do not have miles to go before we sleep. The time to sleep, to rest, is now. We are already home. That's a beautiful paragraph. As I was studying this past week, I found this little story. I couldn't find the exact source, so this may be somewhat apocryphal, so hear it as a parable. But a century ago, there were European missionaries serving in Africa, and they hired some local villagers as porters to help them carry supplies uh, to a far-off mission uh, station miles away. Uh, And the porters walked at a slower pace than the missionaries uh, wanted. So after the first couple of days, they pushed them to go faster. So on day three of the journey, the group uh, managed to go twice as far as they had traveled on day two. And that night, the missionaries were happy. They congratulated themselves on how much uh, uh, ground they'd covered. They'd made much better time. But on day four, when they got up and prepared to leave, the African workers refused to walk. The missionary asked, what's wrong? Why aren't you going to walk? And the spokesman for the African porter said, we can't go any further today. We're not walking today. The missionary said, why not? Are you sick? Everyone looks well. And the African said, yes, we are well. But yesterday we walked so far so quickly that today we must stay here and allow our souls to catch up with us. I wonder, is it time to let your soul catch up. We want to invite you as the Chapel Street family to share in what we would call a a Sabbath experiment. You may already be very intentional about Sabbath. You may have established your own personal and, and family practices, and that's great. But my guess is for many of you, this will be just a bit new and maybe even a little uncomfortable. But we want to invite you to consider exploring what God might want to give you through Sabbath rest. So for the next four weeks, for the duration of this series, we want to invite you to intentionally choose a day. Maybe it's Sunday. Maybe it's Saturday. uh, Maybe it's parts of two days. And if that seems too much, uh, start with half a day. But choose a time to Sabbath. And here are some things that you can begin with. This is just sort of Sabbath 101. First, I suggest, we suggest you unplug. That means unplug from phones, from social media, from TV news. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy to some of you, but trust me, all those tweets and posts will still be there on Monday. By unplugging, you'll create space a mental, emotional, and spiritual space, (coughs) excuse me, to experience perhaps what God wants to give you. So unplug, create space. And in that space, consider taking a walk. It sounds simple, but not an exercise walk, not a purposeful walk, but a Sabbath walk. Try to notice things you would normally just walk right by. Pay attention to what God might want to say to you just last week. I was walking, 
as I do a couple times a day. This was in the morning. And I'm walking and I'm thinking about all the things I have to do that day. I'm thinking about this sermon on Sabbath. And then I happened to notice it was that morning when we'd had a freezing fog the night before and the trees were all white. I mean, every single twig on every single tree, every branch was coated completely with white, like it was a work of art. And I happened to notice, and I slowed down, and sometimes I just stopped. And I had a little slice of Sabbath. Take a walk. Write a letter. Write a letter to, to a friend who might need encouragement. Not, not an email, not a text, an old-fashioned letter. Take your time and write. Write a letter to yourself. Write a letter to God. Take a nap. Maybe take a nap. Light a candle. Celebrate something. Th think of as many things as you can to be thankful to God for. But here's the point. Take time to Sabbath. Put it on your to-do list. Make it as important as all the other things you have on that list. Take time to rest. Take time to delight in the God who delights in you. Maybe it's time to let your soul catch up. I hope you'll stay with us through this whole series. Let's pray. Lord God, how we thank you today for your word. We live in a busy world of work, hurry, and stress. And many of us need to confess that we have often forgotten to Sabbath. Thank you for your great gift of Sabbath rest. Teach us to heed your invitation. Teach us to be people who not only know how to work and work for you, but also how to rest in you. Teach us the joy and delight of Sabbath. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of the God who worked to create all that is and who rested that we may know his rest. Amen. Have a great week.